Have you ever noticed something curious while looking at a world map of flight paths? You'll see arcs stretching over oceans, across continents, even near the North Pole. But there's one place where commercial aircraft almost never go. Antarctica. It's the fifth largest continent on Earth, larger than Europe or Australia. Yet commercial jets seem to pretend it doesn't exist. No major routes cross it. No passenger flights go over it. It's as if the southernmost part of our planet is invisible to aviation. But here's the twist. It's not because it's illegal. Planes can technically fly over Antarctica. They just don't. Today, we're going to uncover why. Because the answer isn't just about geography. It's about physics, technology, emergencies, and a whole lot of cold. Antarctica is vast. Over 5.4 million square miles of land, buried under up to 2 miles of ice. But that's not what makes it a no-go zone for airlines. It's the emptiness. There are no major airports. No emergency runways. No cities. No diversion options. Just endless ice, bone-shattering cold, and an almost complete lack of infrastructure. If something goes wrong, an engine failure, a medical emergency, sudden decompression, you've got nowhere to go. And when you're flying with hundreds of passengers aboard a twin-engine aircraft, that's a problem. A very expensive and very risky problem. Let's talk about ETOPS, the regulation that decides how far a twin-engine aircraft is allowed to fly from a suitable diversion airport. Originally coined as a tongue-in-cheek acronym, engines turn or passengers swim. The modern version might as well be engines turn or passengers freeze. Most modern long-haul aircraft, like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner or Airbus A350, are certified for ETOPS, 180, 240, even up to 370 in some cases. That means if one engine fails, the plane must be able to reach a suitable airport within that many minutes. Sounds impressive, right? But even 370 minutes, over six hours on a single engine, is meaningless when there's literally no certified airport in reach. And remember, ETOPS doesn't just account for distance. It also factors in terrain, weather conditions, and the suitability of the diversion airport. That means a frozen over landing strip in the middle of a blizzard on a remote glacier? That doesn't count. Even if a military-grade airstrip like Pegasus Field is technically within range, it's not classified as suitable for commercial aircraft. These runways are often seasonal, lack proper support crews, and can't refuel or repair a stranded airliner. Also, insurance and regulation play a role. Airlines don't want to gamble with a plane worth hundreds of millions of dollars, or with the lives of everyone on board, on a landing that might work in theory. So even with today's most capable aircraft, ETOPS sets a boundary that makes Antarctica not just impractical, but off-limits. When you're flying at 35,000 feet, the outside air is already brutally cold, anywhere from minus 40 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. But over Antarctica, those temperatures can plunge even further. And while aircraft are designed to operate in cold environments, there's a limit to how cold is too cold. Let's start with fuel. Most commercial jets use a type of kerosene-based fuel called Jet A or Jet A1. Jet A1, the more common international variant, freezes at about minus 47 degrees Celsius. Sounds okay, right? Until you realize that the air over the Antarctic plateau can easily drop to minus 75 degrees Celsius or even colder at cruising altitudes. Now, jet fuel doesn't instantly turn to ice, it begins to gel. This thickening can reduce fuel flow, affect pressure systems, and ultimately starve engines of the fuel they need. That's why modern aircraft are equipped with fuel heating systems that use engine heat or electrical elements to keep the fuel above its freezing point. But over Antarctica, you're flying for extended periods in ultra-cold air, with little opportunity to climb into warmer pockets or divert if things get sketchy. Then there's the hydraulic systems. These control the plane's flaps, landing gear, brakes, and steering. They're filled with specialized fluids, but cold temperatures can make those fluids thicken, slowing response times. In emergency scenarios, every second counts, and a delay, even a slight one can be the difference between a controlled maneuver and a disaster. Let's not forget batteries and electronics. Cold slows chemical reactions. Aircraft batteries lose power more quickly. Avionics systems, especially displays, sensors, and communication modules, can start misbehaving or malfunctioning entirely when exposed to extreme temperatures for prolonged periods. 
And as if all that wasn't enough, cold air is also denser, which means more drag on the aircraft. More drag equals more fuel consumption, which further shortens your margin for safety if things go wrong. Antarctica doesn't just test the limits of technology. It stretches them beyond their safe envelope. That's why, even with all the redundancy built into modern aviation, commercial jets avoid routes where the temperature itself becomes the enemy. There's also a quirky, often overlooked issue, navigation. Traditional compasses become unreliable near the magnetic poles. That's because the Earth's magnetic field becomes vertical rather than horizontal at high latitudes. In fact, Compasses near the South Pole can behave erratically or stop working entirely. Yes, modern aircraft use GPS and inertial navigation systems, but all navigation systems require redundancy. If one system fails, pilots need a backup. Over Antarctica, redundancy becomes unreliable. You're not just dealing with magnetic anomalies, you're also dealing with a lack of radar coverage and minimal satellite relay in the far southern latitudes. It's the perfect storm for getting lost. All right, let's say a plane somehow did fly directly over Antarctica. And let's say, worst case scenario, something goes wrong. Maybe it's a mechanical failure, or a medical emergency, or even a cabin depressurization that requires a rapid descent. Now what? There are technically a few airstrips scattered across the Antarctic region. Wilkins Aerodrome, McMurdo Station, Pegasus Field. But these aren't what you think of when you hear the word runway. Most are made of compacted blue ice a surface so slippery and so hard that special tire and braking adjustments are needed just to stop an aircraft safely. And they're only open part of the year, usually during the short Antarctic summer, and even then, they're subject to extreme weather. No control towers, no radar, no ground crews to clear snow or assist in emergencies, no jet fuel, no medical teams. Imagine trying to land a 250-ton aircraft in wide-out conditions on an ice runway with zero support. That's not just difficult, that's borderline suicidal. Even military pilots who regularly fly to Antarctica undergo extensive training just to land cargo planes, and they don't even take passengers unless absolutely necessary. And keep in mind, if you do manage to land, now you're stranded. There's no terminal, no heat and no way to evacuate passengers without sending in another specially equipped aircraft. It's not just about surviving the landing. It's about surviving after the landing. So for airlines, the idea of flying over Antarctica isn't just high risk. It's no reward. You might be thinking, wait, don't some flights between South America, Australia, and South Africa fly near Antarctica? Yes, but near is the key word. Flights from Sydney to Johannesburg or Auckland to Buenos Aires may flirt with the edge of the Antarctic Circle, following what's known as Great Circle Routes, the shortest path between two points on a globe. But they don't cross over the deep interior. They stay within range of southern airports in places like Chile, Argentina, or New Zealand, just enough to keep ETOPS and emergency planning intact. In essence, airlines will stretch the route, but not their luck. Now here's the million-dollar question. Could this change in the future? Could we someday have commercial jets routinely flying over the South Pole? Technologically speaking, we're getting closer. Aircraft manufacturers are constantly improving cold weather tolerance. New synthetic fuels and additives are being developed to prevent fuel freezing at ultra-low temperatures. Satellites in polar orbit are improving communication coverage. And even GPS systems are evolving to account for magnetic instability near the poles. But technology isn't the only hurdle. Infrastructure is the missing piece. To make polar flights viable, we need real runways with proper maintenance. Emergency shelters, fuel storage, communications relays, ground teams trained in aviation emergencies. And ideally, all of that would need to be sustainable, safe, and operational year-round in an environment colder than Mars. There's also the human factor. Passenger confidence, pilot familiarity, regulatory approval, could governments and private entities collaborate to build Antarctic aviation infrastructure someday? Maybe. Especially if scientific exploration, resource development, or tourism in the region increases dramatically. But for now, it's unlikely. Airlines don't just consider whether a route is possible. They calculate whether it's reliable, insurable, and above all, safe. And until Antarctica has the infrastructure to support that, commercial aircraft will continue to fly around it not over it. Because in aviation, 
progress is measured not in bold leaps, but in cautious steps. So next time you look at a flight map and wonder why that southern detour exists, remember, it's not just ice and snow down there. It's an unforgiving, isolated, brutally cold expanse that stretches the limits of modern aviation. Flying over Antarctica isn't illegal. It's just unwise. And in aviation, wisdom is what keeps you alive. What do you think? Would you ever feel comfortable flying over the South Pole? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more aviation stories from the skies.